believer belonging to a country is not made by its own person. Come into India from outside, laden with it, with its own stores of knowledge and feeling, and his wonderful religious democracy, bringing pressure after pressure to swell with talent to our music, our architecture, our pictorial art, our literature. The Mohammedans have made their permanent contribution. Contribution. Those who have, who have studied the, the lives and writings of the medieval saints and all the great religious movements that sprang up in the time of Mohammedan rule know how deep is our debt to the foreign talent that has so intimately mingled with our life. We remember that Rodunath wrote a poem in Gitanjali, which is very well known by the name Bharat Tirth, where he gives his idea of Indian history, Indian culture, which assimilates everything. Hindura the whole idea of religion that Ramanath had when he started the school in 1901 changed. And therefore, the whole idea of nature also changed along with it. The idea of Topobon carried with itself the sense of uh, giving up luxury. Prabhupada never believed in luxury in his school. That sense remained. But the nature had a very different foundation. Even in the spiritual aspect, in the later part of the school, Rabindranath devised many uh, rituals in Shanti. In 1907, he wrote his first uh, drama on the uh, uh, nature on seasons, that is Sharadot Shot, and uh, kept on writing uh, dramas on the uh, seasons. Another Prokriti Gaan, Prokriti Vardhyaya Gaan. They were all written, majority of When it was uh, started, there were uh, various uh, rules which were uh, in tune with the Brahmana and all these things. This, this uh, Vashonas are still carried out in country. Even uh, today in, in the school, uh, this is going on. But the changes that Ramanath brought about was by giving up a special uh, group or a communal 
uh, outlook and bringing in a secular world. I think I have already taken up enough time. I will conclude uh, my paper with another um, portion of that uh, lecture and it's the university. In fact, Tagore concludes this lecture with uh, this statement. He says, before I conclude my paper, a delicate, delicate question remains to be considered. What must be the religious ideal that is to rule our center of Indian culture? The one abiding ideal in the religious life of India has been Mukti, the deliverance of man's soul from the trip of self, its communication with the infinite soul through the union in Ananda with the universe. This religion of spiritual harmony is not, is not a theological doctrine to be taught as a subject in the class for half an hour each day. It is the spiritual truth and beauty of our attitude towards our surroundings, our conscious relationship with the infinite and the lasting power of the eternal in the passing moments of our life. Such a religious ideal can only be made possible by making provision for students to live in intimate touch with nature. It is another problem to get intimate touch with nature. Kintu, Eivar Jena Rabindranath Otirik to Holden, Shita Hache De making provisions for students to live in intimate touch with nature daily to grow in an atmosphere where they can feel the By making provision for students to live in intimate touch with nature, daily to grow in an atmosphere of service offered to all creatures, tending trees, feeding birds and animals, and learning to feel the immense mystery of the soil, water, and the air. It is not that's a spiritual education. Just I want to remind you that this last part of the uh, sentence, learning to feel the immense mystery of soil and water and air, is exactly what he wrote in Gitanjali, Akash Alotumai Nomi, Mati to my nomi, Bakash to my nomi, don't call it not the day without Ashiba. The school which started with the idea of ancient Tohobon and ancient Indian uh, scriptures dictating the uh, values changed so quickly within one and a half decade that before Vishwabharati was even created, Rabindranath's idea of spirituality, Rabindranath's idea of religious education changed totally. That's what I intended to speak and that 
what I have done will be in fact. Thank you so much. I just want to ask you because you are very expert on this work. Uh, you can talk about the bulletin from the way you see. Akash, Batash, Abu, Babu. পঞ্চভূতের কথা সরাসরি আসছে আবার খেয়াল করব যে কবিতাটাই ছিল আলো তোমায় নমি বাতাস তোমায় নমি মাটি তোমায় নেই এইখানে লিখছেন টু ফিল দা ইমেন্স মিস্ট্রি অফ সয়েল ওয়াটার অ্যান্ড ইয়ার জল অফ তার কথা কিন্তু কবিতায় ছিল ফলে মানে এটা একেবারে ওখান থেকেই নিচ্ছেন এরকমটা নয় কিন্তু আফটার অল পঞ্চভূত এই ধারণা তো রবীন্দ্রনাথ ছিল Excellent paper, and it is obvious it should be excellent. <laughs> so now our second speaker is Sreemashi Chaudhu and Kuntal Narayan Chaudhu. Sorry, Sreemashi, not Kuntal Sreemashi, but Sreemashi Chaudhu and Kuntal Narayan Chaudhu. State College teacher, Bhaktanath. and thank you madam chairperson and best uh, of luck the topic of my presentation today is botany of the world exploring the scientist in the world so uh, a brief background has already already been given by my guest speaker so i am thankful to him also so i just uh, carry on so the world he was a poet of nature but his works and other literary genres and even his art expresses his profound emotional bonds with the natural world plants especially trees flowers were the source of his artistic inspiration philosophical insights and even scientific temperament many comprehensive studies have already been done that deal with individual plants in his poems short stories novels essays and letters the scientist especially the physicist in tagore has also been explored however None of these studies have delved into the unexplored facet of his personality as a botanist. So the objective of our study is to explore the botany of Tagore, the last beacon of record that is saw by between his selected texts and papers, and explore his thoughts regarding the discovery of the tree as a microcosm, the naming and renaming of exotic and native flowers, and foretelling of crisis of plant blindness, much like botanists of his time. So Rabindranath Tagore was at home with nature. Every word, note, brush, brush stroke from him echo the ancient Upanishadic axiom to seek the macrocosm in the microcosm. Plants, especially trees, were at the heart of his universe. The microcosm in which macrocosm of the cosmos is reflected. Referring to the Pamaira palm in the poem Talgat, he accurately conjures up the image of the tall tree without branches. standing on one foot with a cluster of round fan shaped large leaves cluster only at the top peeping into the sky seeking to explore the space beyond the opaque clouds however the moment when the wind stops blowing the leaves grow still and the tree remembers that the earth is its mother tagore in the realm of his mind soared up on the wings of imagination into the ethereal height beyond the physical and mental boundary and plunge himself into new ideas drawn from the vastness of universal knowledge yet at jorashakosh laigamo and shabhiniketan 
He was securely bound to his native soil and imbibed the rich heritage of ancient philosophy, local folklore, and life in Bengal as conduits to the deeper aesthetic magnificence of the natural world. In his essay, My School, Tagore wrote in the context of development of this school as growth of his life, and that the trees here seem to him like silent winds rising from the mute heart of the earth. Perhaps the tree that is emblematic of Shantiniketan is the year pod wattle from Australia. Introduced to the red soil terrain of Bhutan in the early 20th century, this tree with dark green foliage, bright yellow flowers, which is quite imaginatively called the Akash Muni in Bengali, yet with seemingly easy, his lips utter Shonaju, a golden shower. The name Tagore invented for this beautiful acacia tree. On the edge of Shantiniketan and bordered the Shai Kotai River, the beauty and serenity of the forest of these golden blooms thriving on the lateral soil of the gorge like beauteous platform called Kwai is immortalized in his iconic poet ode, Amadev Chotunudi. The nucleus of this unique uh, campus of uh, Shantiniketan. Uh, 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 founded by his father at uh, Chakintola, a seat of transcendental meditation marked by two bodhi uh, tree-like ancient Chakin trees. As one of the pioneering educators to think in terms of global village, Tagore envisioned, uh, envisioned an education that was deeply rooted in one's immediate surroundings, but aspired to connect to the cultures of the wider world, like the vision of the Talgat in his youth. Far ahead of his time and half a century before the Chippewa movement, Tagore had written about conservation of forests and the close bond between humanity and trees as microcosm. In the story Bolai, Tagore highlights a boy's love for shihun or silk cotton tree in front of his house. He does not let his uncle cut it down, but in his absent absence, the deed gets done by his childless aunt who refuses to forgive her husband for his wanton act. In his poem, Shobhata Prati, the opening lines a clarion call to get back the wilderness in return for the city and its steel, earth, brick, and stone, the cruel, uh, fiery new civilization, and return all sacred grove, a grove of Tapuvon, and it concludes with the desire to be one of the rhythms of boundless universe. Tagore has an intimate relationship with nature, trees, and flowers. In the opening lines uh, of a letter to Nirmal Kumari Mohalanubish, Tagore insightfully observes that flowers bloom on boards, but people hold them in their hearts by giving it a name. The emphasis on applying names to each plant species is the cornerstone of plant taxonomy. And European botanists and explorers of the age of exploration. He traveled extensively at home and abroad and discovered a multitude of foreign and indigenous flowers that were new to him. Responding with the botanist spirit, he named more accurately, renamed both cultivated alien and wild indigenous flowers. The world passionately nurtured many exotic plants in his own garden in Shantanikita. He renamed foreign flowers in the native Bengali to build an emotional bond with them. The purple wreathed wine brought from Argentina bloomed after a long wait into blue gem like array of flowers, and the difficulty he faced in greeting this nameless flower made him to name it Nilmoni Lotha. Captivated by the sweet odor of hanging precisals of Rangoon creeper, he baptized it Modhu Monjori Lotha, and he simply refers to it in another poem as Modhu Monjori. Other well known examples of renaming foreign flowers by Tagore. Include Bagan Vilash, Heen Champa, Full Juri, Sheikh Muni Shorobi, and Alokan. These vernacular rays near renaming of outlandish stars helped in their cultural adoption and assimilation into the fabric of Bengal's social cultural media, where foreign origins steadily faded away from collective memory. Tagore disliked the English name Bougainvillea, which honors the colonial explorer Louis de Bougainville. Its new Bengali name, Bagan Vilash, given by Tagore, presence and endeavor to decolonize this plant's name among the Bengali people. Uh, he had also penned thousands of letters, both in Bengali and English, 
Perhaps it is impossible to completely fathom out his mind, but his countless letters can draw us closest to him. His letters to Nirman Kumari Mohanalubish include topics as diverse as contemplation on philosophical matters, reports from Shantini Ketan, and observations on the natural world. In poignant private correspondence with Nirmal Kumari, Tagore laments about human apathy towards most flowers that he observed in his daily experience. Using his inimitable poetic imagery and philosophical flair, Tagore points out to a cognitive bias against plants. He, quite sensitively, without utilizing the word blind as a metaphor for dysfunction or deprivation of physical or moral vision, touches upon the phenomena of what is now termed as plant blindness in all currently recognized dimensions. Tagore mostly deals with commonest manifestation of plant blindness of now not catching sight or not taking notice of flower, being literally blind to them. To his utter dismay, Tagore realizes that even sublime beauty floral blooms can fail to draw the interest of most people to these ephemeral splendors except for large, bright, seasonal flowers adorning our gardens and our living rooms, most humans fail to see these flowers. Even the plethora of trees, beautifying parks and avenues, fail to seek the attention of our eyes until the pleasant fragrance reaches our noses. Restricted to literature, many are known only by me, and most people who are even unmindful of their existence. Tagore also touches upon expression of plant blindness by means of ignoring their value, Perceiving them, perceiving them as trivial and not appreciating their singularity that is being figuratively blind to them. He deals with this human indifference towards nature, whose most visible elements were undoubtedly the flowers he loves so much. He doesn't hide his disappointment at people's interest being limited to flowers used only for ritual or ornamental purposes, which clearly hints at an ignorance of wider significance of flowers and plants in nature and to humans. He contrasts the internalization of the names of flowers with that of rivers to suggest a prejudiced viewpoint where plants are insignificantly blurred in the background of any landscape. Furthermore, he refers to the ubiquity of flowers in poetry, yet he found few with any interest in pursuit of real flowers to appreciate their aesthetic appeal. Finally, as a poet, he articulates his helplessness in dealing with anonymity of un unknown blooms. And as a philosopher, he, admission, he admonishes us for a narrow vision and for clinging on to darkness of materialism when dealing with the natural world. As a keen observer of nature's magnificence and human wantonness, Tagore, with his usual sagacity, had anticipated the much later conceptualization of the problem in society called plant blindness as a human indifference and bias against plants and flowers, long before the term itself was coined at the conclusion of the last century. I would just conclude by saying that Rundunath Tagore, an inimitable poet, writer, philosopher, musician, artist, are merely accolades for a person who was far ahead of his time. His vast body of work spanned across uncountable uh, genres and limitless subjects. He was not only a humanist whose quest was the perfection of humankind, but also an environmentalist whose pursuit was a harmony with nature. Philosophers of science have customarily accepted the value of observation in the epistemology of science. Observations are the solid foundation on which edifices of scientific hypothesis and theory stand firm. Tagore was a keen observer of his surroundings, both natural and cultural, at home and abroad. He searched for the unknown within the known, and this utilitarian facet of science gives it a spiritual dimension that fascinated Tagore. Although the omnipresent plants, trees, and flowers are often ignored in common sight, however, Tagore leads us to realization of the significance, even to the point of adoration, not just for themselves, but for what is revealed, implied, signified to them. Like the botanist, but in his own way, as a literature laureate, Tagore devotedly explores and closely observes the vegetal world and to draw meaningful insights about the wider significance. Uh, of the problems of identity and the challenges facing them. And in doing so, he was often way ahead of his time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful TED talk. And uh, actually, I connect the online. 
And now we just want to request Dr. Shimon Sarkar, Assistant Professor, School of Social Science and Language, Lovely Professor, Professional University of Punjab. So we may start last session, panel number three. So can we request you to deliver your lecture now? But please, uh, uh, I'm requesting you, please uh, present your paper of the day because I'm shortening your time. Are you? Can you hear okay. me? Yeah, uh, ma'am, this is a joint paper. Am I audible? Am I audible, ma'am? Am I audible? Am I audible to you, ma'am? Start your lecture and please try to wind up with the Okay, uh, what I'm asking is if I am audible to you or not. Yes, you can be much audible. Okay, okay, okay. I have a co-presenter with me. Uh, this is a joint paper basically. And uh, uh, he is uh, Anirban Dev Sharma, who is a theatre practitioner and uh, independent scholar. Whatever. Uh, is my uh, screen visible to you? I hope so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Anirban, do you uh, would like to st start? Yes, so uh, we would like to uh, thank uh, the Society for Indian Studies to organize this two-day seminar and uh, we take this opportunity to present our paper entitled Revisiting Bengali Theatre in the Light of Bengali Renaissance. So, uh, the advent of the British colonialism in Bengal heralds a new era of social, religious, cultural, intellectual, and artistic movement. Bengal Renaissance apparently disrupts the existing mainstream performing arts tradition, dramatic arts tradition in this case, rooted in the folk popular rural base. However, it transported it to a higher sophisticated domain of peri-urban society of colonial black towns, in this case, Kolkata, uh, Calcutta at that point of time. This new theatre was definitely Europeanized, but it was not at all a complete copy of European cultural ways. It remained a strong critique of the Occidental traditions, outward and innovated by the Orient. Now, as you can see in the slides that we have uh, tried to give a brief timeline of the milestone of the development of colonial Bengali theatre. The earliest known proscenium playhouse was the theatre. In uh, uh, which was established in 1753, it was destroyed during the Sirajuddaulla Calcutta uh, seize in 1756. Next, noteworthy uh, proscenium playhouse of European theatre was Calcutta Theatre, which remained functional from 1773 to 1808. Uh, First, Western style proscenium stage for the Bengali audience was attempted by Lebedev in 1795. Interestingly, an original Bengali Pepe house from the Bengalis took another 40 years to come. In, seven, in 1831, Prashanda Kumar Thakur established Hindu theatre where Bhavabhuti's works and Shakespeare's plays were staged. It was Lovin Chandra Basu who staged a Bengali theatre for the Bengali Mass in 1835. He adapted Bharat Chandra Rai Gunagar's Vidya Shundar. He also used a mixed cast in, the, in this game. In between, we find a continuous a continuation of the English theatre catering to the European masses. Chaurugi theatre, Saususi theatre remained operational and influential from 1813 to 1849. 1850 onwards, we find more performances are coming in. This were well liberally adapted from English and Sanskrit as classical texts. In 1817, 1853, the students of Oriental Seminary set up Oriental Theatre and staged uh, Shakespeare's works. In uh, 1854, Pyari Mohan Basu established.
establishes uh, Jora Shaku Theatre, which stages a Shakespearean works as well. Now, 1857 can be considered a watershed. And there was a political transition going on. It left its imprint on its Bengali colonial subjects and the Novurish Bengali elites and affected their creativity and recreation. In 1857 on, 1857 onwards, basically, we find Bengali playhouses being established more often, who performed in Bengali language, who adapted from varied indigenous sources. To name a few, Belgachya Natoshala, Vidyut Shahini Rangomancho, Shotubabu's Natoshala, Bungio Natala, etc. Here we witness a definite shift in themes and choice of the performance. The adaptations were either classical, the Sanskrit drama, for example, Kalidasha Sadikamam, Shukuntalam, Malavik Agnimitram, Vikram Urboshi, Bhavabhutis, Malati Madho, Bhattanarayans, Veni Shankar, etc. Or they were originated, they were original Bengali plays, satires or skits, penned by Ramnarayan Karparatna, Michael Modishudan Dattu, Dinabondhu Mitro, Nir Musharaf, Jogendra, Dokhosh, Dokhina Chaur, Chattopadha, etc. They chose contemporary social issues as their subject and addressed polygamy, polinogotha, child marriage, plight of the widows, etc. Gradually, we also find development of anti colonial themes, the most important being Neil Lorbon in 1860. In support of the Indigo Revolt, the staff, and which was, I consider, a staff departure from the previous uh, loyal colonial period. Establishment of National Theatre in Calcutta in 1872 heralds commercialization of Bengali theatre by introduction of a ticket system for the audience, for the viewers. The traditional viewing habit of the Bengali audience, that is by sitting all around or at least on three sides of the performance space, gave way to the frontal view of the Western proscenium and drop curtain stage. By closing of the 19th century, professional Bengali theatre would grow with stars like Orthendu Shekhar Mustafi, Amritulal Basu, Girish Chandra Ghosh, etc. They were being patronized by nationalists like Shishir Kumar Ghosh, Mabukupar Mitro, Mon Mohan Basu, etc. Interestingly, the themes were becoming more rooted, patriotic, and often anti colonial with nationalistic overtones, which prompted the Bengal, uh, British government to come up with the Dramatic Performance Act in 1876. Now, uh, thus we see that the pre colonial performance, which were uh, the, basically the forms were Jatra, Panchali, Kubikan, Kamta, Brutopatha, Akrai. And uh, the subject style and elements were from Bhushna Padabuli, Koryo, Bhushna Shahito, Mumbul Kapu, Rama, and Mohabharat, where the authors were mainly Kanahuli Dotto, Vikrudash Pillai, Jogodash, Kubidaj, Dijo Madho, uh, then uh, Kritiba Shodha, Odha, Chandra Bhuti, uh, and Kashiram Dash. And the themes generally remained glory of the uh, local deity, that is the Mumbul Kapu deities, links and heroic events, Vedic and Puranic rituals. Whereas, the themes of colonial theater is quite varied, and it varies. There is a racial uh, component as well. So there is one first category is the European stakes in the white town, for the Europeans by the European. And here the main things that was in use were Shakespeare and Moliere. Then there was another, uh, there was European text which has been in use in the black towns, which was again largely Shakespeare in English, most, and it was most popular among the English educated students and it was confined within the elite class of the society. Then they, again, there was another uh, another uh, type of uh, development was going on, which was where we find European and Indian texts in the black town in vernacular medium, that is in Bengali. So Shakespeare, works of Shakespeare were translated and adapted into Bengali. Kalidasha, Baba Bhutia, Sri Harsha, Sanskrit plays were uh, adapted and translated into Bengali and play staged. And then Bharachan Rai Ponakar's Vidya Shundu remains a very common theme. And then further, there is a hybrid development, a development of hybrid states, which is uh, quite anti-colonial uh, in nature, which comes from, uh, which is and quite original as well, from Marty Michael Mudushudan Dato, Dina Bunhu Mitro, Jogendranath Ghosh, Dokina Charun, Chakchapadha, etc. Now, Bengal Renaissance, if we see Bengal Renaissance vis a modern Bengali theatre, we can uh, we find three aspects, three uh, characteristic of it. First, there was a denial in the existing performances. So, uh, because uh, they were considered vulgar, not standard, rustic, not urban, not soft enough, 
for the uh, uh, the intellectuals uh, that the city uh, based intellectuals it's the of the colonial cities then there was a uh, there was a phase when rereading of the indian text was taking place okay the translation and direction of the sanskrit plays epics and puranas and then again there was a recreation recreation of the unique indian forms were developing which was where we find the the form was europeanized like the uh, proscenium stage was adopted the type kinds of light and props that was adopted however it was not actually a copy of the european cultural ways it was unique uh, for and uniquely created uh, with indian uh, rooted ideas rooted in indian society and uh, societies and uh, economics and political structure of at that point of time now recurring themes in this post renaissance bengali theater uh, we can largely divide it into two categories one is romance that is sonishta shiri farhad ali baba this type of themes and then anti colonial and within anti colonial again uh, i would like to divide into two categories one is the social issues because ultimately these social issues and the uh, the theaters that come that were coming out of the social issues addressing social issues they were actually a, a replication as a result a interaction as a result of our interaction with the colonial government or the colonial uh, education and that was mainly confined to polygamy address polygamy child marriage plight of the widows caste system etc whereas the nationalist and patriotic theater that was uh, concerning the uh, uh, the heroic tales of shirajuddola chandragupta and plight of the indian peasants so that does we see that the pre colonial theater uh, theatrical tradition which was embedded in relig uh, religious and ritualistic narratives were sidelined it was substituted by socio political secular and thematic narratives catering to the western educated babus and podrulus of the colonial black towns it just opposes pre colonial bengali theater confined in the standardized believed homogeneous community uniform mindset conforming to the caste and gender hierarchies with heterogeneous heterodox and intermix intersectional and often contradictory mindset of the colonial bengali theater this bengali theatrical pursuit of excellence taking place in a conscious isolation from its last rustic roots it was initially it was eliminated from the mass and it was confined to the uh, urban elites only renaissance beatified theatrical movement in bengal crossed the caste and gender barriers also to some extent which was not present in the previous time post renaissance theatrical tradition in bengal if considered a complete colonial import that marginalized the indigenous theatrical forms was a tactic adopted was maybe a tactic adopted by the western educated urban intelligentsia and the nuburish of calcutta to gain colonial legitimacy and when they failed to do so that is to fail to get that colonial legitimacy it become an instrument for the uh, expression of nationalist sentiment during india's freedom struggle Bengal Renaissance thus inevitably brought the peri-urban Bengal to uh, to the middle class leadership and aesthetics who found it hard to accept ex uh, escape the colonial reality. Therefore, it further becomes instrumental to the progress of nationalist theatre tradition, exposed to the colonial exploitation and cultural penetration. So uh, that's uh, all I had to say uh, today. Uh, and if you have any question, I don't know how much it is. Re it was relevant with the. Uh,
because I'm quite tired. So I will try to be as concise as possible. I don't know whether I will be successful in it. So my uh, topic today is Krishna love, promiscuity, and Rabindranath Tagore. Actually, in the 19th century, it was not just a period of inquiry, but it was also a time of retrospection in various areas of life, including art, culture, and science. And if we look at European Renaissance, then we will see that a particular aspect of European Renaissance had been the revival of the classical way of life and the classical learning. But it was not its mere revival. Rather, the classics adapted to the new world had seemed to guide the way for the Renaissance humanists. In the 19th century Bengal as well, the past sought to be retrieved. And many a time, contemporary literary themes and forms derived their inspiration from the past. Myths and legends came to abound in literary works as allegories of contemporary situations as well as individual longings. The 19th century celebrated rationality. It was a period when Indians started to claim a place in the material progress of human beings. But beneath the surface of materialistic cravings lay the yearning for love and the finer aspects of love. Now, in this paper, uh, my attempt has been uh, to address Rabindranath Tagore's employment of the Krishna mythology to underline the pining of human minds that sought maybe some respite from all the noise and chatter. Now, Tagore was deeply influenced by the medieval Kodavali literature and might have chosen Krishna as a model to communicate his thoughts. However, this article does not intend to be a mere exposition of Tagore's romantic ideas or his description of Krishna's promiscuity while dallying with Radha and the Gopinis or the coward girls. On the contrary, it shall try to inquire if at all Tagore's imagery of Krishna, as represented in his collection of songs titled Bhamshingya Kodavu, indeed try to show the other side of the Renaissance man who at times might have wanted to retreat to his inner domain far removed from the demands of time. Now, we all know that Tagore was both shaped by the new ideas of the 19th century and we all know of Tagore's eclecticism. So I'm not going to go into detail uh, of that. So uh, we, what we see is that the diverse tradition, diverse traditions and experiences were imbibed by Tagore and this became a part of his consciousness. Hence, like the Upanishads, uh, the popular Baus, the Sufi saints, Kabir and Dabu, along with the Bengal Vaishnava tradition, left a lasting Im imprint on him. Uh, since this paper primarily focuses on Bengali Vaishnava tradition, the resonance of which can very well be felt in his works, uh, my particular focus shall be on Anushingar for the book. Now, since Tagore was always in the quest of divinity in humanity, in humanity, the Vaishnava thought and philosophy perhaps made him realize how human love can be transformed into a divine one. Now, Tagore had become familiar with these Vaishnava ideas through his study of the Vaishnava poets. We know uh, from his Jivan Sriti that he used to love to read the anthology of ancient poets uh, compiled by Akka Chandra Sharka and Sharda Charo And we also know that how uh, young Tagore uh, was intrigued by the tale that uh, was told to him about an, a young poet, Chattata, who would uh, write uh, in the use of uh, ancient poets. Inspired by that, he also uh, tried to follow in the tradition of Brajaguli writings and thus uh, was born his first Kodaguli, Gamala Kusuma Kunja Bajir. And, uh, and so much, Tegar was so much original in this that he could easily pass off as an ancient Kodaguli poet. And uh, we see that his friend even believed that uh, he had indeed found a manuscript of an ancient script from the Brahmo Samajis library. Now we know that this was the beginning of Tegar's foray into Kodaguli composition and he wrote under the synonym, uh, he used the synonym Bhanushinko. And the compositions came to be known as Bhanushinkar Kodabu. Now, this was published in Bharati and immediately had a wide appeal. Now, Tegara was so much in awe of the Vaishnava Kodabuli poets, Chandidash and Vidya Kodi, that in his Bhanushinkar Kodabu, he deliberately adopted their style, so much so that his works could actually pass off as compositions of an ancient poet. And in his Jivan city, he uh, wrote about an incident about one doctor, Nishikanta Chakrabarga, who actually believed that he was the original, he was actually 
Germany and uh, ancient uh, poet. Now, uh, what we see is that that uh, why did not feel so attracted to Vaishnavism or that this Krishna ideology? Because uh, it this uh, ideology neither projected excessive intellectualism nor was it tied up in excessive ritual practices. It stood for acceptance and tolerance. Infused even the mundane with beauty and was against all forms of social ritual. Thus, his choice of Krishna seems obvious. Krishna is depicted in the medieval Padavali literature is not bound by any social code. His promiscuity and dallying with Radha and the other gopis was in strong defiance of social custom. Perhaps Tagore found in Krishna a model of resistance of colonial rule, or perhaps as material progress. In the human life, the selfless love of Radha for Krishna, the image of this divine couple in their idyllic setting, the pain of separation that Radha undergoes might have led Tagore to his favorite retreat to the inner domain of human consciousness, untouched by this mechanical world. Now, at a time when print culture and Western education sought to bring revolutionary changes in Indian society, Tagore's engagement with Krishna metaphor might seem to some as an attempt to turn the wheel of time. Actually, the 19th century was a period of transformation. It was one kind of a corridor between tradition uh, and uh, modernity. Now, while confronting the West, a quest was also made to trace the roots of indigenous past dating back to the pre-colonial times. Bengal was in the forefront of the British political, economic, social, and cultural sphere. In such a time, it was uh, natural for some to seek a departure from the manifold intellectual and economic advancements. It is in this context that Krishna probably came to the fore, not as a solace for disillusionment that people faced during the time of colonial rule, but might be as alternative life choice. Now, was Bhanushinger Padavali an attempt of Tagore to show the other side of Renaissance man? Renaissance humanism was definitely not just about development of human faculties to cater to just his physical, physical needs. But the 19th century society, reeling under the pressure of colonial rule, seemed to have lost touch with the inner workings of human life. Now, uh, it is uh, evident, uh, we can see that uh, though Tagore's engagement with this lyrical ballads began during his adolescence, yet even when he began to achieve fame, he could never abandon this project, but at the same time, for years, would also refuse to acknowledge that he had actually written them. He even published a fictional biography in 1884 of Bhanushingo, where though he did not accept that Bhanushingo was actually him, he nevertheless dropped close hints regarding his identity. And uh, we see that these poems who were originally written by a 14-year-old Tagore went through constant revisions till he was 18. The theme of this Padavali filled with poignance of Radha's love for Krishna is nothing novel. Uh, the promiscuity of Krishna and his love uh, with the gopis especially Radha, and his separation from La Radha leads pain of Virava is a recurrent motive of the medieval Padavali literature. The novelty actually lies in Tegar's treatment of his theme. The ballads focus on the emotional distress of Radha as she constantly finds for Krishna. And the poet makes an entry into the plot as Radha's confidant, Han, in sharp contrast to the earlier Vaishnava poets who use their real names he used the name Bhanu that did not reflect any religious commitment. Also Bhanu, who served to console and counsel Radha, as Tagore put forth through his poetry, was not a young eligible woman, but a middle-aged lady who though herself was in love with Krishna, could only be there to witness and comfort and occasionally even challenge Krishna, but could never express a love for him. Did Tagore want to portray as an alter ego of the modern man whose desires lay suppressed amidst the rising demands of colonial rule? If Radha Krishna imagery could be a medium for Tagore to express a man's longing to find a niche for himself and listen to his heart's inner desires, unfettered by all rigid rules, then could Radha's amigo Bhavanu represent 
Yet another strand of the same modern man who dared not to defy the social norms. So it is futile to build up theories on such shaky assumptions. The dichotomy in Tagore has reflected in these other ways in the character of Radha on one hand and Bhanu on the other is hard to miss. While these poems in all of their renditions never uh, belied the essence of Viraha, it nevertheless underwent change in the course of the poet's life. Initially, they had a strong emphasis on the erotic forms of love. But as one pours over the changes documented meticulously by the editors of Vishwabhavi Press in the last printed tradition, the change in the tone becomes very much evident. The dominant erotic mood is replaced by humility as one faces unrequited love, particularly when the focus shifts from Radha to Bhanu. This shift in Tagore's thought signifies Tagore's mature religious sensibilities that reached a high stage of development by the time of the Anjali, Kamalu, and Dikai. The poems, that is the Bhanushinkar Kodavali, are arranged in a way that ends with Bhanu and Radha both growing old and looking back in retrospect at life, a life spent but unfulfilled. The poems, these poems, the permeate with pain is nevertheless far, is nevertheless far from being a dark tale of love. The unfulfilled love of Radha and Bhanu could very well signify the quest of the Renaissance man to look beyond the material existence into a different world full of possibilities but mired in difficulties. The promiscuity of Krishna, Radha, and the Gopis, and above all, Bhanu, were perhaps Tagore's window to this world. Thank you. The end is also very nice. <laughs> Really, very nice. Monkey Man, Shindu Nanda, So, for today, everything went very well. Thank you, everybody. And thanks to my helping hand and peers and uh, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all the others. It was excellent. And thank you to at least uh, help me to do so. So really thank you and thanks for all.